Delighted to have you back for this our show, which is Thinktech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This is our 254th show, and you're likely to be around our 13,600 viewer, which we appreciate. We are broadcasting live um, physically from only one place in the world with me, your host, Martin Despang, here in Munich, Germany, but spiritually uh, with uh, DeSoto Brown as well, who's always back in his Bishop Museum uh, back in Honolulu, where he, unfortunately, about a year ago, it feels like um, he uh, broke his wrist by doing uh, maintenance on his two slippery roof at his Bishop Museum. And he's getting surgery uh, to improve the aftermath of that. So all the best for that, DeSoto. We have our fingers and wrists crossed. And if we can get the first slide up here uh, to have me just give you sort of an introduction to the framework of uh, multiple shows we're going to air uh, from uh, this week, which is uh, basically building upon uh, the past shows where we keep you updated about the newest developments in our Honolulu, Hawaii, which is as we have extreme sparsity of land. It uh, has to be uh, that we are very uh, conservative and uh, precise with that land and so not sprawl anymore, but build high uh, versus horizontal. And that leads to buildings that we can call high rises, or there's another name for that, or a certain species of high rises we call skyscrapers. And this is uh, quoting DeSoto from the preparation for the show that, again, is our show, but I delivered on our behalf of today. And he was investigating in the terminology of uh, skyscrapers. And skyscrapers, of course, he didn't waste time, as he said there. He spent time very wisely on figuring out what that is. Because we're initially uh, looking at skylines. This is where we're going. And then when you Google, uh, you know, where our skyline stands uh, compared to competitively uh, in the world with the other skylines, you get confused because there are multiple rankings of multiple sorts of different qualitative and quantitative measurements. So that's why the solo did this here. And uh, first of all, the definition of sky, uh, skyscraper he uh, shows here, it has to be at least uh, 100 meters tall, which is that metric thing that we Europeans have, roughly 30, um, uh, 300 feet is that what it translates to, and also a minimum of two meters uh, uh, floor height that you can occupy. That is more generous because in Europe it's 2.5 meters, a little below that is the minimum you can do for, for housing. But anyways, that's pretty much what it is. And obviously, we're not uh, where America was um, at its best in mid-century, where it was leading the world, and it had things that no one else had in the world, uh, including skylines. Ever since, uh, many uh, cultures have surpassed the United States of America in many things, also in terms of high-rises, especially in Asia. Uh, actually, the tallest high-rise in the world happens to be um, in the Arab world, uh, the Borish Khalifa, as they finally called it. But it is designed by uh, American expertise, by the pioneers in uh, this typology, because Americans were the first ones to build it. So the Arabs, especially back then until, until these days, they're trusting uh, Americans to do that. So in the firm uh, that designed that tower, we will uh, visit or revisit soon uh, in the following weeks uh, of the show here. Our show quotes to the right uh, show us a little bit, a, I guess, a dilemma of uh, when we talk about skylines, because a skyline is nothing else or nothing more than an accumulation of individual buildings. And they all together then form what we might call a silhouette. But that silhouette, uh, you can mainly uh, see when you are on the ground and you see that silhouette basically distinguishing itself against the sky. That's where the term skyline comes from. In cases when you are a bird or a big bird that carries human beings as airplanes as the predominant way as we get to our islands of Hawaii, 
uh, you will not have uh, the view of a skyline. You will have the view of, uh, there's not a term for that, but we can say a landline, right? Because you see a bunch of dots, they're kind of spotting the ground, but you don't see our particular island, uh, islands have a natural skyline, and these are the mountains, as we see in the, in the show quote in the, in the middle there. Uh, and these uh, mountains are a natural skyline. And that's what, when the Polynesians and later on Cook uh, first came uh, by a boat, they saw that natural skyline. It was a line, the top of the mountains clearly distinguishing uh, itself uh, from uh, the otherwise flat horizontal line of the Pacific Ocean in that case. So ever since, uh, especially since uh, Hawaii joined and had to join, uh, had little choice, uh, as some say and complain, uh, rightly so, uh, it, it joined uh, the United States of America. Then this very American invention uh, of high rises created another uh, skyline that is um, sort of juxtaposed with uh, the natural skyline of the Mauka. And one could argue or raise the question, are they in contradiction with each other? And we make that case often that we say the natural uh, Mauka, uh, Hawaiian for mountain skyline is a biclimatic system that um, in fact, um, it creates our paradise as far as its lushness and all the splendoriness of um, you know, water and fruits. Um, and all of that wouldn't be there, at least not to that extent, if it wouldn't be for the mountains, the Malka, because that's where the clouds get stuck and then it starts to rain. So very biochromatic. It doesn't take anything from the earth that it, gets, that it doesn't, it can't get back. That is different with the high rises of at least these days. It used to be different mid-century, the pioneering days, when, when architects came to the island, they thought, oh my gosh, I'm so privileged to be here. Um, at that 50th state that is so different and so much more paradisal than all the other states. Um, uh, sorry for that, for the other locations that we're listing some here that we're getting to in a second. And they truly try to lift up to that uh, as much as they could. And the show quote at the top right is us uh, polemically proposing to be that again and uh, basically plant and grow, so to speak, uh, high rises that are of different natures. These are all primitivas that we think are more um, in line with the natural skyline uh, of the mountains. So that ranking at the very bottom left is obviously then um, taking that isolated view only to the United States, because again, the highest, uh, tallest high rises in the world um, are uh, in Asia, and uh, but here we're concentrating on the United States of America. And we can say, probably no surprise to you, this ranking probably even for everyone not familiar with this subject matter is probably not too much of a surprise that New York City has the most high rises. And then we have the cities of Chicago, Miami, Houston, San Francisco. But surprise, surprise, we uh, score number six. Uh, we're just before Los Angeles. And that's pretty amazing because again, we're a pretty small island. But again, uh, given that we have scarcity of land, it makes sense to build high and not horizontal. And that makes us having uh, take that position here. Uh, we should keep in mind though, that we, if we would have a collection of postcards of, um, all these skylines here, we would find them rather alike or not that unsimilar. That is a problem. Uh, again, uh, if we would have compare them from mid-century, uh, likely they would uh, be different uh, amongst each other because mid-century one, one was more sensitive of living with the environment versus against it uh, in the later decades, especially ever since um, our favorite uh, president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, had to pass on the baton to uh, Ronald Reagan, who was absolutely embracing the fossil uh, fuel age. And we're thinking we're still in there, although Vladimir Putin gave us a pretty brutal break on that one, is giving it currently to us. Uh, he's been bombarding again his troops' uh, um, dwellings. Uh, high rises uh, buildings where, where people 
live. That's the worst. Civilians uh, get killed. That's the worst. So this is a wake up call for all of us to get off that fossil train and get back to the pioneering of the mid century, uh, our heroes in that area. So um, that's why we're on this fossil we have been so far and you know have to get off it fast. Um, but uh, that's why these skylines are highly sort of infested by that fossil mindset and high rises in Miami look like in Chicago and like in Houston, and San Francisco. However, the climates in uh, the United States, the continent of the United States is comprised of a multitude of climate zones. Different than in Germany, we're currently experiencing uh, a heat wave here, unprecedented costs. Some will still argue we don't. By climate change, uh, uh, um, Southern Europe especially is uh, in the hundreds and the hundred tens. Um, and um, there's a drought series. Uh, we're getting a kiss of that as well as being in the hundred here today, hottest stay on record. But people in um, uh, Arizona, Phoenix is not on the list. Its skyline is further down. I've just been talking to our previous and future guest, Larry Medlin, who lives in Tucson, Arizona. He will laugh about us because it always has 120 degrees. Uh, in the desert uh, uh, most of the days, but architecture for that has been um, adapting to that accordingly, uh, using thermal mass because in the desert, the nights get cool, which we're lucky to have as well. And we will later in the show, uh, show you a building that American architects have been building in the desert. And we'll show you another one that will be built there soon. And the Burj Khalifa is, they're all by the same architect, SOM, Skidmore, Orange, Merrill. So um, again, we, we should keep that in mind, that again, the circumstances, the climatic circumstances, uh, climate and what informs culture at least used to and, and should again, should uh, make these uh, skylines um, all, all different, um, which, which they aren't. So um, as to broaden our horizon uh, above and beyond uh, our uh, most remote list from our landmass, um, we will visit uh, in the coming weeks, and we start today, one of these cities, and that is the number second on that list, and that is Chicago. Chicago, as to give us an idea to position that, is um, part of the Midwest, although when you look at the map, it's kind of a little weird because it seems to gravitate towards the east, but um, technically it's part of the Midwest. It's the very eastern part of the Midwest. And the Midwest, uh, I'm an expert in because I spent uh, on the invitation of the University of Nebraska and its president. They gave me a scholarship in the early 90s uh, that made me to spend a year to study in the Midwest. And in the early 2000, 2005, they invited me to come back uh, to coach for uh, half of a decade uh, there. So I'm very familiar with its climate and with its culture. And uh, it's pretty much the same as in uh, Chicago. And Lincoln, Nebraska, where I've been, is uh, shares something, but in the opposite way to uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, while Honolulu is the most remote from all land masses, Lincoln, Nebraska is, all, is the most remote from all water uh, body uh, of oceans. Uh, Chicago, and we can get to the next slide, to the second slide for that. Uh, takes a little different position because um, um, that's why the show uh, name, the, the four S's has one of the words is shoreline and it borders water uh, as we do, but not the ocean, but a lake. And that is Lake Michigan. And from Lake Michigan or into Lake Michigan uh, as it originally was, but for pollution, the river was actually reversed technically as an uh, enormous undertaking. That is the Chicago River that we see at the very bottom right. So with this compilation of images, um, we want to encourage you uh, through us to think about when was the last time when you had been in the city of our investigation of the coming weeks uh, in Chicago, or if not, uh, let the show inspire you for you getting to know uh, Chicago. And this way here is uh, sharing us uh, with you when we were there uh, the last times or the first times. 
And uh, you see at the very bottom right, that handsome young man uh, is our co-host to Soto Brown in the mid eighties, where both he and I had stuff on our heads that we don't have anymore, which is hair. And he is standing in front of uh, to the big building to the left, the historic building is 35 Wecker Drive which uh, if you're into the Batman movies, just before the Dark Knight series started, that movie before that one started on that building there, uh, on these, uh, on these uh, columns there. And it is also called um, the Jewelers Building because this is where the most of the jewelers in Chicago had their headquarters. For that reason, there are goofy things like elevators that take cars up. There's a cupola up there in that cupola um, is where one of the main architects in Chicago, who unfortunately passed away not that long ago, he got hit and killed by two cars when he was on his bicycle. bicycle. And that's my fellow German uh, born architect, Helmut Jan, that um, our uh, other co-host and mentor of the show series here is the gentleman who you see on the Picture at the top left, the one on the right, is my best American buddy, Dan Kubrick, who ever since graduating from the University of Nebraska, works for Helmut Jan and uh, continues to work for him and is currently um, having the office of Jan, who is in 35 Wecker Drive, to move to what is uh, in front of the Soto, which is the Wrigley Building. And he's in the process of facilitating and moving the office to that location there. So uh, what was different in the mid eighties down there uh, what, what the Soto spotted there, uh, you see a river, but there was really no embracing um, the, uh, the river as a, as a waterfront, uh, as a waterfront walk. And that's one of the recent developments and improvements in Chicago that happened over the last uh, couple of years. As in many American cities, as back then when it was more, it's still car centric, but that was the beginning of star, of car uh, centricity. So people just basically drove um, and they didn't care for the waterfront. That has changed recently. This is a really beautiful waterfront walk now that you can enjoy the river. There's restaurants and bars down there and a lot of landscaping. And you also see just behind, you know, uh, DeSoto's head, you see another line, another city line that's an elevated one because the whole city of Chicago is sort of elevated on that sort of continuous plinth, that line that you see there. So what the buildings seem to stand on is the street level, but their foundations go further down. And then there is this um, cavity space in between um, the water line, the water level, and the street level. And, and that's where all the facilitation, all the garbage trucks, all the technicians, um, all the maintenance facility people basically access and maintain and keep the city running without clogging it on the streets where the main uh, traffic uh, basically goes. So again, DeSoto was there in the 80s, mid 80s, as this picture tells you. The other building next uh, to the Wrigley building on the right that we give you uh, the name, the data is at the very bottom there is uh, from the 60s, from the early 60s. And that's what the Soto told me he uh, first witnessed uh, and was in Chicago the first time. As far as myself, um, again, um, when I was a student there, um, I, um, mobility wise, um, we, uh, Chicago was the city that uh, was the closest to us as to do field trips. And that's something we're missing the most out on with our emerging generation in Honolulu, that it always takes a flight over uh, to any other place uh, of significance of cities that we can study um, uh, talking uh, car centric uh, in the Midwest. Uh, you can drive to other cities, which Soto always is rightly so keen on pointing out, never mind from Lincoln, Nebraska in the heartland, uh, which indicates there's a lot of aloha, and it is, I can confirm that, you can theoretically and even practically get yourself into a car, uh, put it on cruise control, go on I-80, 
uh, and another eight, nine hours later, he's going to end up in Chicago. And that's how I basically saw and witnessed Chicago the first time uh, when I was in studio there uh, together with Dan. And our professor, basically, who was the best ever, um, um, who basically told us to have a field trip there and meet there. And his name is Alex Meller. So hi, Alex. Hope you're doing well. And thanks again for everything. What was so great about him that he didn't babysit us. He basically said, OK, let's meet in Chicago that day, that hour. See you there. So no bus rented or anything. We had to get there. A show quotes at the very bottom left. Um, don't get yourself maybe too excited because uh, Dan uh, was a proud owner of his 1960s Pontiac GTO, the embodiment of a muscle car. Uh, myself, a little bit uh, on the uh, more average uh, side, also shown my 72 Plymouth Fury that Dan kept running, um, as we will further explain when we reconvene our automobile shows. We didn't take any of these. Uh, these are obviously gas guzzlers, although that wasn't an issue uh, because a, uh, the gallon was a dollar to make you jealous of what is it now, five bucks. And that's a good thing because it's a wake up call. We were rather innocent back then. So what did we do? Uh, Dan went there with a couple of classmates uh, by himself in a car and I went with Jeff Chetwick. So hi, Jeff. Chef was a proud owner of, it's not his, his car, but alike. I Googled it and credit the source there. You see that rusted out car, which is a Honda Civic, first generation Honda Civic. And that car literally had more rust than anything. And the four of us drove there. And by the point we were reaching, back to our show title, the skyline, uh, we saw something that you also see at the very right on the picture with DeSoto. In the very distance there, you see the top of a high rise that has two antennas on top of it. And that is the most iconic uh, building in Chicago that used to be the tallest high rise for quite some time. And that is the uh, originally called Sears Tower. I'm holding it up, a Lego model of it as of now, that a couple of shows ago, I was telling you that I gave it to our son Yoni. And he basically said, hey, did you keep the, the packaging with it, uh, the box? And I said, no, I didn't. And he said, well, stupid you, because otherwise it would be worth some money now. So I learned that. <laughs> so this is, an, according to Yoni, the Lego expert, obviously a vintage uh, Lego version of the um, Sears Tower, which is now not the Sears Tower anymore, but called the Willys Tower, which they even had to print on there. So that building, uh, when we were in that rusted out Honda Civic and you saw these two antennas, my classmates stopped the car, pulled over and basically said, well, you got to drive. And I said, well, okay, but why is that? I said, well, because that is a big city and you are from Europe and you know cities and uh, we don't. And I basically said, come on guys, um, we have Lincoln, Nebraska, which is the capital, but the smaller uh, city. And we have Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska, which is a multi-million inhabited city. Um, and um, so they were familiar with that. They just needed to get that. So um, they took over driving soon after that, once they understood it wasn't really much different to drive in Chicago than um, in, in Omaha, Nebraska. So uh, that's how we basically uh, then um, approached the city. We saw the skyline first, uh, next slide. And that's how I, after a decade now, thanks to the hospitality of Dan, was able to revisit Chicago again. Um, no basically accused, but explanation because of our remoteness in Honolulu that we have to work on, open ourselves up more. Uh, CV City more. Um, it, it used to be my hub in and out. Uh, even in my desert days in Arizona, I always took uh, my other stopover flight to Chicago, but uh, I hadn't been doing this uh, for almost a decade. So I revisited it again. So at the very bottom, you see me revisiting that way of approaching a skyline, which DeSoto says we hardly have that, right? We can't come from another state. And all of a sudden we see our skyline that is not happening. You can obviously live out west and you have to drive on H1. At some point, there's a very scenic situation where you see the skyline unfolding, but you cannot see that from any other state coming there. 
So this is it. And, and the bottom picture you see at the third left, once again, these two antennas popping up. So that is the Sears Tower. But also you see another couple of other buildings basically sticking out and popping out uh, of different heights. And that also is a difference to Honolulu, which we will continue to talk about. But the position of where DeSoto was standing in the previous slide, if we recall that, he was right where basically uh, the boat tour with the Vandellas are. And that is at the top right is my ticket upon the recommendation um, of Dan. He said, take the Vandella and the Vandella give you a really great view of the skyline because that Vandella boat goes out uh, into the lake and the picture at the top left is one of the many that I took from out on the boat. This is still in the dock there on the river, but it actually goes out into the river and, and looks at the skyline. And so this is the, uh, as of now, current skyline of Chicago. For various reasons, we won't talk, we won't show that much the building that you see in the very center there, because this is the Trump Tower. And for some several reasons, we're not so keen about talking um, the, the former client of, or the, still the owner of the building, we don't know as we don't quite agree uh, with his uh, way of doing politics. Uh, but we will talk about many of the other buildings here that you see here that uh, were all new to me and that have basically popped up ever since um, uh, I was there a, a decade ago. And so we're um, almost at the end of this little appetizer for uh, exciting show volumes to do uh, the Soto and I. And um, so we will compare uh, our skylines and uh, how much they share and how much they differ and should differ. Because again, there's nothing, uh, my final word talking climate, uh, there's nothing uh, colder than uh, walking in the winters through the canyons of Chicago where I first heard the term wind chill and that is chilly in Chicago. That's colder that you can get it. And it's in the summer as hot as it is right now here, but very, very humid. Uh, that we know from Honolulu, but not the cold. So we leave it with that for today. Uh, please uh, see us again next week. Please all stay well and get well, especially DeSoto and everyone else. I have recovered from uh, COVID, thankfully, hopefully everyone else too. And so see you uh, next week for kicking off our comparison of our uh, shoreline, skyline, cities of Honolulu and Chicago. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.